Some of you have seen the walls that are in the church today. Man of God against another man of God. Woman of God against another woman of God. Child against child. They are attacking each other on Facebook. They are attacking each, attacking each other on YouTube. They are attacking each other in, in, in the courts. They are attacking each other everywhere. They are fighting each other. This is what I learned early. You cannot function in the two. And these I mean criticism and intercession. You cannot function in both offices simultaneously. If you are a critic, you're not an intercessor. And if you are an intercessor, you cannot criticize. Can I say it again? If you are a critic, you're not an intercessor. And if you are an intercessor, you cannot be a critic. Many of the things that we are dealing with and the egos that are being bruised, you attack me, I attack you. You fight me, I fight you. You do this, I do this to you. It's because we are not in the place of prayer. Listen, the chosen are not going to be perfect. They may not be perfect, but they're chosen. They're chosen. I don't know why, but he chose them. Are you following me, child of God? Our challenge is we are so quick to judge than we are quick to intercede. This is a lesson I learned very early. Very, very early. God showed it to me way back in my university days and revealed it to me so deeply. Learn to pray for people. Not only do we pray for you, our church family? There's many layers and I'm going to come to that. But we also pray for our enemies. Enemies, those who hate us. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 43, he says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. We pray even for the wicked. Even for the wicked. Those who wish us evil, we don't pray against them. We pray for them. One time, there was a fellow who came to me and threatened me to destroy our ministry. And he gave me terms and conditions that if I don't submit or yield to those terms and conditions, he was going to make my life hell. We have mafias too in the church. You know, some of you think everybody walking around you is a Christian. No. Some of you must grow up and understand that some of the people we're dealing with in the church are satanic agents. From hell itself. Initiated to destroy the righteous. They're just there to destroy lives. You believe everything they speak about other believers. But you don't know that Satan too has sent agents to destroy the church. Do you think he likes seeing people get born again every week? There was a man of God I remember. And so I was telling you the story. Let's go back to the story. Thank you Lord. Now, this man threatens me. We're going to destroy you. He said, we're going to make sure that you'll not be able to walk these streets again. During that time, a false report comes out by the same man, his group. And you know what they wrote? That 60% of the children of the girls in the University of Macquarie had aborted because of the grace gospel. 
did they get all the girls who had bought it and put them in one room? And then concluded that of their hundred in this specimen, 60% is the grace message. We went to, was it Afrostone? We did a huge meeting there. I remember there were about 12 children. Six of them, five. I told them, let's pray. Every Monday evening, we went and prayed from 6 to 9 p.m. non-stop. The power of God hit Livingstone. The power of God hit, hit, hit Africa. And then I told them, once you make 100, I'll start teaching. And then the presence of God was so mighty. I remember some of them were slain going to their hostels. One young man came from one hostel to go and go see his girlfriend. He reached in the middle. The power of God arrests him. He pauses like this. The power of God was so strong. And I remember we went into the TV room there. Started making the crippled walk. Leukemia healed. Miracles and one, signs and wonders started happening. One of the famous prophets in Kampala even came to, to understand because we were telling him there's a funny guy in Afroston doing something. He comes, he had a very bad sight. As I was preaching the gospel, his sight was, was healed immediately. He puts on the glasses, he can't see. He puts them off, he can't see. The moment the power of God started to flow, you know what they said? That I have abortion rooms in Africa. The living hall, the hall. That we have abortion rooms. That's criminal. But these were satanists. These were satanic agents. How can you have an abortion room in a hostel? Who is doing it? How many? Which girl came out and said, I aborted and I aborted it in that room? And some of those who were envious with us carried that story. This same individual. And then they started, and then they, they funded some newspaper. And I remember one day I woke up, and this newspaper read, some of you read it many years ago, who I began with, New Sex Cult in Kampala. Two girls come to the office. We want to interview Apostle Grace. He's done a great job. My lawyer calls me and says, there are people who want to be interviewed, at the, who want to interview at the office. I tell her, my spirit tells me this, these people are not right. I, my spirit had refused. My spirit had refused. They took pictures at the office. You know how they take pictures? They took pictures of people who had come at the office. And in the, in the, in, 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 they put those same pictures in the newspapers. And then they write, these Apostle Grace's chicks. Imagine people who had come. You know somebody come into the office? You understand? I think during that time there was even a married lady who had come to the office to give her tithes. The husband saw it and her marriage went in trouble. Then they took pictures of us on the streets preaching. I don't know those girls when they see this, how they sleep. You know, you sex cult. And a man calls you after those days and says, are you ready to talk or should we continue? You understand what I'm saying? Now, a pastor, uh, a supposed apostle, gets this newspaper. This interesting newspaper. This sex cult. You're promoting sex and perversion and all these kinds of things. He goes live on Christian television. No, radio. One of the famous Christian radio stations. I'm driving back home. The late Musaibu Kenya and his wife call me there in the car. They say, tune on this radio station. You won't believe this man of God is on, on, on radio reading that newspaper to the believers, warning the church. And he calls himself the apostle. He's one of those who, who believe they, they are the apostles of the, of the nation. He's reading it. Are you following what I'm saying? Everything he's reading is false. In there, there's a picture of me at one day they are preaching the gospel. But nobody's asking themselves, what is this young man doing on the streets? You see what I'm saying? So, he speaks and 
He speaks so evil about me, never met me. So I go to the Lord and I said, Father, what do you do? What should I do with such an individual? Because I felt so disappointed. My disappointment was not in what the man said, the little I care. Because if it's not true, it's not true. You understand? If something is not true, it's not true. But it was in how this man actually thinks he's serving God. That was the pity I had. I was angry. Such indifference. And the Lord told me, bless him. I got a check and I wrote him a check. And I sent him money. Told him, thank you for serving God. You get it? Now, he sees the check. Why have you given it to me? I'm celebrating you. Takes my check. A couple of weeks later, he's back at me. Again attacking. No, again attacking me. He's again attacking me. I had. But every time I went to the place of prayer, to inquire what was in the heart of this man. The Lord told me, no. He's seeing what he could have been. Every time he looks at your ministry, he feels it was his. Those people you're preaching to, he feels he should be the one preaching to them. The Lord told me he has no problem with you. He has a problem with the anointing on your life. You get it? So, instead of fighting or hating or speaking ill of this man, I went in a place of intercession for him. And I promise you before God, I prayed for that man. So, a couple of years later, he still comes to me and he has a need. Because he remembers once I gave him money. I have this need. How much do you need? This much. I gave him. And then another time I had, he sits in a group of people saying, Join me to attack that false minister in Kampala. It's so funny. The people who were in that room told him, mm. Man of God, we have seen you with him. <laughs> and then a few days later, he's calling me, Hi, you bless me. Thank you for the message. But he's fighting. But because I'm empathetic, I see he is a, a fruit of a wrong foundation. I can only pray for him. I have nothing against him. Nothing. Nothing. Now, if somebody asked me, what's the secret of your ministry? What I've just explained. I can feed a hungry enemy. Another young man started gossiping about me, gossiping about me once. I went to God. I said, how can this guy do this? He's in my peer. He's in my age bracket. And the Lord told me, envy, envy, envy. The Lord said it three times. So one of those days, I am, you know, somewhere, and I discover it was a flyer and an announcement that he was going to do a very uh, big meeting somewhere in one of those universities. I went to the sponsors, not sorry, to the organizers, silently, without him knowing, and asked them, how much does he need to organize this? And they told me, and I paid for it. You understand? And I, I made sure they don't tell him. I made sure they don't tell him. I paid for the meeting of the man who speaks evil about me, and I made sure they don't tell him. You get my point? I want to sit where strong men sit. To have my portions among the great. I cannot be consumed by the evil of other men to lose God's best. And if it means that I should continue doing him good, even for my sake, 
that I am made up to do, and that is regardless of whether he reciprocates it or even ever gets to know the least of my concern. Most important is that I am right before God in preaching the gospel. Now, this is the secret of why some of us are entrusted with people like you. You get my point? That's why even if there's an issue in the church, I'll address the issue, but I'll never speak a man of God's name or ministry. Because I was not sent to break the ministry. I was sent to build the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you must understand. The same people, this same person I'm telling you, is one of those few people, I, those, few, those men of God I pray for. You don't know what it's like for a man to do all this and you find yourself saying, God, I pray for his life. I pray for his children. I pray for his ministry that they will stand. I pray that you remove envy out of his heart and give him a heart of love because there is a price in losing the chosen. If he's taken out of the picture, the church suffers a loss in spite of his madness. Now, I'm not telling you these things to, to, to be right before you. No. I'm telling you these things because for some of you, it's the only way you will act likewise. I'm teaching you what to do. Don't fight people. Don't find yourself on altars fighting and exchanging. Our seed does not fight. Our seed doesn't fight. Especially the anointed. We don't. None of these men has ever come to me to speak evil about the other. None of our wives has ever sat to discuss another person's. We don't. We don't do that. My wife has never sat down to tell me about a pastor's wife. Never. Never. I don't know it in my house. That's not who we are. It's not who we are. You get my point? That's not who we are. So if somebody comes out of us and they act that way, like the Bible says, they were not of us. They had to go out among us. For if they were of us, they would have stayed with us. But God had to make them manifest that they were not all of, of at all of us. You get my point? But how do you manage to keep yourself in that kind of pain? Intercession. Pray. Pray for them. If you hear minister falling, pray for him. I've been in a place where somebody brings me a report about the man of God and I, I see the proof and the best I can do is pray. Pray for the minister. Because if God can change a whole nation, I repeat through prayer. What about this individual, this one weak person? And what would happen if they are transformed by my prayer? Then I've done what God wanted me to do. I sit among the great. I sit among the great. I sit among the great. The seed of greatness on my life is strong. I'm of that portion because I'm an intercessor. My spirit is strengthened, re rejuvenated every day because I stand in the place of intercession, not criticism. I don't criticize people. I don't. I can say this is wrong. I can point to a witness, a point and say this is wrong, but I don't attack people. Even the man who did these things to me, I found myself, I mean the first fellow who had warned me, I found myself praying for him because he got a very deadly disease, almost to death. I had to pray for him. I had to pray for him. Because there was still enough space for mercy. That's, that's how God has dealt with us. I mean, look at us. Look at you. Put, get this light off everyone because some of you are so, so accustomed to that guy does this. The other woman does this. Now, get the light off everyone and put it on yourself. What is the guarantee that you should be alive now except the grace of God? The Bible says he has not dealt with us as he should. Some of you, 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 Judge people who have not even done a quarter of what you have done in life. You're worse. 
but you're here judging that woman, this man, the other one. And for us, everything passes. For us men of God, it seems as though everything spoken about us must be true. You get my point? There's a, a man of God, very big name in Kampala. He has convinced of several people that I have three wives and they all sit next to each other in the church. Can you believe it? <laughs> and a certain man of God phoned me and was convinced, why do you put your wives together? Three. <laughs> there are three, three wives. I married them and all of you were there. I married the first one. You said, uh -huh, welcome, mama. You have three mamas. <laughs> I'm telling you. So a bishop calls me and says, why? Why? You get my point. So, even for those, you find that the first thing you have, that's why I said, if God doesn't humble you to minister to your ego, if it's bruised every time, you will fight. That's why some of these men can't stop fighting. Because the egos are massive. Once you prick a little pump, how could he attack me? Oh, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> world war. <laughs> but are you going to fight the whole world? No. Satan will continue sending these arrows. What's the best way to beat the devil? Stay on course. Just stay on course. Stay on course. Stay on course. This is the heart of God. 